trips like ours will be rare. I feel very, very unhappy that due to man's inconsideration that my grandchildren will probably not have the opportunity to share this experience. And if that's progress in the true American sense, perhaps that's, uh, that's the price of the computer age. Human beings have been in the Four Corners area for over 10,000 years. The hunters and gatherers and the people that followed them just had an encyclopedic knowledge of their environment. Every single plant that would have grown here, they would have known about and known how it was useful to them. The animals that lived here, their patterns of movement. In addition to that, they had to have a really detailed knowledge of water sources because people need water every day. The biggest change in human beings' adaptation to this environment came with the introduction of agriculture. The folks that farm southwestern Colorado primarily did what we call direct precipitation farming, or some people call it dryland agriculture. They weathered many droughts, including some that were more severe than the one of the late 1200s. You know, one of the lessons is that at certain times, that success broke down. Many people today believe that technology can solve any problem that we're going to face and that we are impervious to failure. And yet the study of the human past shows us that um, it's, um, it's almost impossible to find a society where that's the case. History plays a role in where we're going into the future. We've come a long way, but yet we have a long way to go. The Utes 
overall used to roam, not own, roam based on seasons. Our creation story is the creator had a pouch and all these people were in it. He built the world, everything, and he had all these people and he wanted to rest. He sat down by a tree and way over there was Coyote. Coyote was curious, what's in that sack? So he snuck all the way around, came over, and just as he was gonna grab it, the creator awoke and he said, hey, what are you doing? And the bag fell over and all the different people ran out. They all went into the different parts of the world. And when he grabbed the bag, he just had very few people left in there. And those were the Ute people. And he told the Ute people, I'm gonna keep you here in the mountains, close to me, so when you're praying, I can hear your prayers, you're right next door to me. So that's how we got here. Gavu, which that means where the mountains are. I think agriculture is, it's the lifeblood of this community. The land, the development of it is from the water. If you have irrigation, you can guarantee that you're going to have some crop to sell and some income at the end of the year. It's hard, you know, it's hard financially. Um, You've got to be tough to be a farmer. You get one paycheck a year. The Dolores River is the lifeblood of this community. If we did not have that water, we wouldn't be having this community. We would look more like the desert. We're dependent upon the resources. Comes from, comes from the land, comes from the water development and uh, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of our community. Well, it's, you know, it's been a way of life here forever. The sad thing is we don't have a lot of younger generation kids wanting to be farmers. It's just not a bright future for dry land farming anymore. You make less money probably on beans than you do any other crop. When the water project came in, about 90% of the people that signed up for water put in alfalfa. Totally cut my bean acres in half. The water people kept saying, don't put in 100% hay, because if we have a drought year, you're not gonna be able to keep it alive. Well, most of those guys did it anyway. And then of course, sure enough, along came drought. But a lot of times when there's drought, they don't get all their water either. Like if we have a short year of water, some of them will actually put in beans because they can survive with less water. Growing crops in southwest Colorado, I would say, is it's super challenging. Most places you can go out and put something in the ground and grow, but you have to really baby this stuff along. The winds, the dry weather, erratic frost, you never know. We get 22 inches of water per acre, and now this year we get 10. 
because of the drip irrigation, I'm not worried about that because uh, with the way we have it all set up. It has saved us water, but it also, it, it's made it possible for us to operate on extreme drought years. When normally people are getting shut off in the first part of June or even later, we've actually had the water people ask us, hey, can we finally shut you off? I don't water as often as most people do either. Sometimes we do drip irrigation without the black plastic just because it saves us so much water, even in extreme drought years. So it's been really, really nice. I do find that the planting and diversity of things really saves our bacon a lot of times. This was all hay filled when we first moved here. And I remember walking out here with my bag of seeds standing on that edge and looking out across and thinking, hey, this is home, you know. There was a great deal of excitement surrounding the, the creation of a brand new body water in Colorado. From the standpoint of the availability of a large new water supply for irrigators in the area, but also the Dolores project was predicted to have immense recreational benefits for fishermen. And the downstream river fishery below McPhee Reservoir was touted as having thousands of new angler days. Conditions that existed for the first five years after the dam closed, roughly from 84 through 89, were ideal. During that five-year period was probably the golden era for, for trout in the Dolores River. They designated the first 12 miles from the dam down to Bradfield Bridge, flies and lures only, total catch and release, I'm sure with the idea that it would become, you know, a quality fishery. And it did, I mean, that fishery took off. It went absolutely crazy. By 1987, I would put the Dolores trout fishery below McPhee Dam up against any river in the state of Colorado. And it developed under extremely perfect conditions. We were in a very wet cycle. There was no delivery systems out of, out of the reservoir complete yet. The whole ball of string started to come unraveled about 1990 when we had a dry year, a very dry year in the Four Corners and drought conditions were prevalent. They took the flows from 78 cubic feet per second to 20 cubic feet per second. Here I was, a biologist sitting on a golden resource with water flows being reduced in the heat of the summer. We knew the outcome could not be good. The, the flow stayed at 20 CFS, I believe, for 100 and some days. It was estimated that the fish kill was 40 to 60%. You know, fish need water to live. Low flows equates to less habitat, less food, and higher water temperatures, and all of those are detrimental to the population. There's 150 river miles, a whole river ecosystem that's being affected. It's not just 10 or 12 miles of a man-made trout fishery. It's native fish a native fish community all the way from McPhee Dam to the San Miguel River confluence. Since 1990, 
the Dolores, it's been a real roller coaster. You know, there's been some good years, there's been some really bad years, and there, there's been some devastating years. Really, since 1990, we've been in a very prolonged drought in this corner of the state. And when we get into serious drought conditions, the fishery suffers dramatically. My constituents feel like they own part of that water. Being a county commissioner, everybody has a particular interest that they're passionate about in that river. Because they're so passionate about whatever their interest is, whether it's boating, whether it's you're a farmer, whatever it is, each side feels threatened from the other side. But in reality, everybody owns that river. What most people talk about is, is oh, everybody's afraid of change. Well, I can tell you nobody is afraid of change. People are afraid of is is a loss or a perceived loss of something. The particular loss or perceived loss here is that if they let more water go down the river for the fish, that they will get less water for their farm. All the water is already allocated. There is no extra water that, that is available to send more down the river. There is passion involved on both sides of the issue. There's passion on, for the fish, there's passion for the farmer. Uh, it's gonna be hard, hard to get this fixed. of the American West where the thought was there was plenty of water and we can dam these rivers um, and use them primarily for agriculture without consequence necessarily. There wasn't enough water in this river to satisfy all of the agricultural dreams, all of the municipal dreams, all of the treaty rights and maintain a healthy ecosystem for fish and a river that's good for recreation in the Dolores River Valley. To go on a trip on the Lower Dolores, first you kind of have to be like a mountain lion ready to pounce on prey because the situation has to be perfect where the mountains fill up with a ton of snow, fills up the reservoir so that there's excess water to send down the river, but we don't really know when that's going to happen until late March, maybe April, maybe even the beginning of May. So if you're a boater and you want to raft this river, the Dolores River, you got to drop everything, make it happen, get there at a moment's notice. And that's a challenge because of the way the reservoir is operated and the fact that it's managed primarily for irrigation and municipal uses in Montezuma County and, and Dolores County. So when they announce a spill, it pays off if you make it but if you miss the trip, you gotta wait another five, 10 years. When I first came to boat the Dolores, it was after one long stretch where there were no boatable flows for about four or five years. And it was really hard to find campsites because there's low use. The river map is a little outdated. 
and it, so it can be difficult to actually find a place to camp. Luckily over the last seven or eight years there's been a dialogue going on between all the local stakeholders and operators of the dam and irrigators and other um, conservation and recreation groups. Those dialogues have gone a long way to at least set some standards that clearly define what's good recreational boating, but it all depends on how much snow falls. There is really, if we look at it, one priority. 85% of the water that used to freely run through the Dolores River is now used for irrigation. What we would like to see is a change in those circumstances so that there's more flexibility with how the, the reservoir is managed and that would allow more access to more of the recreational public and the fishing public to the lower Dolores River. The challenges of getting more of that water to stay in the river and actually stay in the Dolores River Basin rather than being diverted over into the San Juan River Basin are huge. People are seeing that there's going to be a necessity to change if we're going to adapt to the future in front of us. If I could change anything, it would have been beneficial to have a better understanding of the deepness of the shortages that we were going to experience as a project. The future is about drought resilience. How do we deal with a hydrologic cycle as we are likely to experience it? Uh, we're really working on how we manage through those cycles and it really requires one set of objectives when you're low in the reservoir when you have no buffer and you're totally relying on snowpack then really the emphasis is on trying to minimize the shortages that you're that people that are relying on your water are going to experience fundamentally if you have a federal reclamation project with a certain set of obligations, we're going to irrigate this land, we're going to provide these cities with water, and there's, a, there's laws, reclamation law, and then all these reclamation contracts to operate the project. Then you get downstream and you got a different set of mandates and those things are in conflict with each other. So what we're trying to do is reconcile how do we do our best in in, as far as taking care of the downstream values without diminishing uh, the water supply needs and benefits to the community. Water is very important for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, especially for economic development if we're going to ever move into the future. Through history, have never really been told the true story of how we came to where we are today. We've become a state-of-the-art farm and ranch project. We use scientific technology today. Instead of going out in the field, we've done it all computer technology. So you don't have to even go out there. Only thing to go out there is just probably change the nozzles on the sprinklers. One of the challenges for Farm and Ranch on the product and water allocation is McPhee, the reservoir itself, does not have a huge runoff based on Mother Earth and the snowpacks in the mountains. and it's getting shorter and smaller allocations. It's a great enterprise. It's still a challenge. Farm and Ranch is really just right on the border of breaking even or in the red. We went from uh, 24,000 acre feet for Farm and Ranch to 10,000 acre feet But we need to look at it from the business side and see how we're going to move forward. 
And every farmer can see that. Back in the 90s, we had water because we, the project wasn't fully developed. Then in 2000, it, it became fully developed, and, and that's really when we started seeing all our water problems. It's the years where you're right on the edge. Are you going to fill or are you not going to fill? Forecasts can be off. All the time you're filling, you still got your irrigation demands going on. So our, our runoff period is April, May, and June. And we've got a, a cutting of hay in the middle of there, so there's quite a bit of demand on the reservoir at that time, too. We have 62,000 acres that are, are served by the project. As far as the downstream, you know, they're, they're the second largest user. They have the second largest allocation of water in the reservoir. But during this drought time, it's been a killer. I mean, it's been hard. So we don't. We've never operated outside the drought, really. The water that comes out of the Dolores Basin and goes into the San Juan Basin through the Montezuma Valley and the irrigation there, it's a big deal in a number of ways. It's a really big deal for the local communities and folks' livelihood. It's also obviously a big deal for the Dolores River because none of that water is coming back. When the project was created, there wasn't really a big focus on the native fish and, and things like that. And so, you know, that's come into the picture later on and it, it can't really be pushed aside. It really has to be, has to be dealt with. These are places people should go and really discover for themselves. The Dolores River is surrounded by incredible public lands, vast acreages of wilderness study areas that represent some of the most beautiful and wild country we have left in the United States. We haven't had time to understand how magnificent they are, how expansive, and how beautiful. The national conservation lands are made up of wilderness areas, wilderness study areas, national monuments, national conservation areas, and they really are some of the most culturally and ecologically significant lands that, that we have. Dolores or Cortez, those are gateway communities to these incredible wilderness study areas and these public lands. So that kind of economic activity will remain in the towns that are, are nearby these places. People stop in these places, they fuel up, they may stay in a hotel, they eat, and then they go out and they can see that wild piece of the American West. I mean, the emotion that I feel is, uh, you know, it's really sad today that we can't have more people come and see this place. You know, and that's simply because it's so hard to forecast and predict when there will be enough water to sustain a five-day trip. You know, we don't see flows like we used to when the Dolores was run, and it was becoming this icon of the river running culture. It always helps me to think about the Dolores Project in context of all the other major storage projects in the Colorado River Basin. We know so much more now going through NEPA and going through Endangered Species Act and mitigating the impacts of these large federal projects. Um, 
it, I often wonder, you know, what would the Dolores Project look like if it was proposed today? You know, sometimes life just kind of leads you in a direction. I had not ever done rivers or thought about doing rivers until you're around people that are enjoying that same element that the river provides. I started running the Dolores River with Rocky Mountain River Expeditions in 1973. What you felt as a young guide was very much um, challenge and difficulty. Conditions were cold, cold. That water coming down reminded you of how much snow would melt in a day or two. That it formed this river that was silty and brown and went up and down from day to day. But there was always current and always challenge. We were always hitting a lot of rocks. <laughs> Back in the late 70s and early 80s, anybody with a pickup truck and a few thousand dollars of discretionary income could go out and buy a boat and set themselves up as a river out there. We had a pretty Spartan existence. We didn't eat near as well as we do now. We cooked everything on open fires. The only thing we took with us was a little grate. I guess in my years of, of running the Dolores, we would probably average somewhere between eight to 10 trips a year. If you just did the top section, it was a three day. If you went down all the way down to bedrock, it was a five day. Well, I've always described the Dolores as one of the three best river trips in the country. I would rate it right up there with the Grand Canyon, the Middle Park, the Salmon, and Idaho. It's because of the quality of the resource, the, the beauty of the canyon that you go through, the pristine wilderness that you float through, and back in those days, the quality of the whitewater. Well, I can think of some old days on the, uh, the Dolores River. The weather can be anything. Sleet and hail. Then you got your other days where it's just 75 degrees, the water is running nicely, it's... As the river ranger, I'd get phone calls and I'd talk to people from Washington State, Massachusetts, Connecticut, people from all over the country come for the nature of the Dolores River experience. Idaho, Texas, Oregon, as great as the campsites and hikes are, and they're good, it's, but oh, as soon as you get everything packed and all, then you sit down and you just go, ah, and maybe you tuck your oars in, back on the river again. The white water is a nice thing, and people enjoy that, but I can remember, oh man, two, two different years in particular, being at Snaggletooth Rapid, and you get there at a certain point. And I got to where uh, I would not eat lunch before Snaggletooth.
The biggest limitation was, were you a good enough guide to get through Snaggletooth? When you're sitting there and scouting that rapid and the weather's bad and all, everything, your stomach just starts turning and you got big water. The Dolores set everything else apart. The ones that made up their mind that it was too hard, they didn't come back for any other training trip. Yeah, the Dolores River is very iconic, but it's really a river no more. It needs to be seen and supported, and it needs to be a river again. So if we're going to solve the problems of the Dolores River and water in the American West, we need to change a few of our ideas about how to use water. Protection of our water supplies really hinges on doing our very best with the downstream environment. We all have a stake in the health of our rivers. At the very most basic level, we have a personal responsibility as humans to take care of the, the animals that live in that river that don't have a choice. The fish, the insects, all the other animals that are found in a river environment. The water rights really guide a lot of what can and can't be done here. And the reality is that the water is spoken for. It really has to become a willing situation for somebody that has water rights to want to, um, or to need to, um, potentially, um, enter into a situation in which some of those water rights could somehow be transferred. And I understand, I, I understand that, you know, there's a lot of other uses that could be done if you control the water different. We want to have all the fish and we want to have the boating and we want to have the crops and we want to have water down below the dam. And if that river dries up, we're all done.
without developing these mechanisms for fair and just sharing of these resources that, you know, it's a matter of the quality of life. Look at what we have inherited in the Dolores that we see today. And is that really what we want to leave 50 years from now? You know, before the demand from the public is there to protect the place, there's a small group of local stakeholders that recognize its own intrinsic value, part of their identity, part of the identity of their community, and that it's worthy of protecting. Are you set? set? One, two, three, four. I'm gonna strum my cares away, watching the sun sink into the bay. It's too high to work, so here I'll stay. Strumming my cares away. You could spend your whole life punching a clock. Maybe get the third best house on the block. Spending all your free time mowing the yard. Who wants to work that hard? I'm gonna strum my cares away. Watching the sun sink into the bay. It's too hot to work, so here I'll stay. Strumming my cares away. When the ukulele head to the shore, tell your boss you just can't take any more. If he tries to stop him playing the song, he might want to tag along. Ooh la la la. From a pro, you got nothing to fear. Maybe you're afraid you'll forget all the words. Ooh, what? Ooh. I'm gonna strum my cares away. Watching the sun sink into the bay. It's too hot to work, so here I'll stay. Strumming my cares away. I'm gonna strum my cares away. Watching the sun la, la, sink la, into the bay It's too hard to work, la, so here la, I'll stay Strumming la, my cares la, away Ooh, la, la, la Ooh, la, la, la Ooh, la, la, la Ooh, la, la, la Wow, thank you again. <laughs>